Go ahead. Good evening, everyone. Uh, this is the College of Complexes, a free speech forum. Uh, we're open on Saturday nights. Uh, we have three rules. Two rules. One, one full at a time and no personal attacks, right? Two rules. Yeah. And we try to keep it civil. We can express different opinions, but uh, don't attack anybody verbally. And tonight we'll have uh, basically an open mic. We'll probably have about four speakers, maybe five or eight, 10, 12 minutes apiece, depending on what their topic is. So we're putting it together. There's three people in, uh, three or four people in the college in person here that'll fill in and then a couple people online. Maybe. First guy is going to be Adam Broad. The first second guy first is, speaker will be Adam Broad. Second speaker is going to be, uh, wait. Is it about Ernie? Ernie, Ernie Norman and then Charlie Paydock and then we'll we'll see. Then how we'll go from there. Yes. Okay. Is the topic Gaza Palestine? Please keep the noise down in the background. Oh, tell us the topic. They say keep the noise down yeah. so the people on uh, it's Palestine doing... and Gaza. All right, Charlie, let's get started with the announcements. All okay. right, Charlie. welcome to meeting number three thousand seven hundred and fifty six of the college complexes, the playground. For people who think, um, now although we we had to get new, new arrangements for this evening's program because the originally scheduled speaker had health issues, so we're, we appreciate the people coming on to fill in uh, and carry the program forth. Anyhow, uh, although I am not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our upcoming programs. Uh, on March the 9th, our own Jonathan Martin will be returning to tell us about why he maintains that Reaganism is alive and well in the political community of both political parties. March the 9th. On the March 16th, the Libertarian Party candidates will be running in the March primary will be making their presentations on why we should vote Libertarian. On March the 23rd, uh, Justin uh, will be coming, and he has a collection of political illustrations or memes that he has assembled from social media on a wide variety of topics. He usually has quite a collection of these. On March the 30th, uh, Fran Tobin, local activist, will be talking about law, the, the serious issue of long-term care for people with disabilities or the elderly. So long-term care uh, uh, actions, a uh, very important issue. Transitioning into April, we're going to have our special Earth Day series of speakers. Uh, on April the 6th, Andy Anderson, who just spoke, uh, will be talking about things we can do personally to bring to bring an end, a, a stop to climate change. On April the 13th, a uh, young lady will be talking about seniors and how they want clean air and water. Seniors. On April the 20th, the Illinois Green Party will be giving us some information about their latest activities uh, throughout the state of Illinois. On April the 27th, Henry Perez, who attends regularly, will be giving us a talk on why you should vote for anybody for president, anybody for president except Joe Biden. May the 4th, I'm looking to get our annual May Day speaker. I think we're going to have two people from the AFL CIO in Washington, D.C. On May the 11th, D. Knight, an author and activist for many, many years, going back to the Vietnam War, will be talking, talking about his new book, uh, Promoting Peace. That leaves May 18th and uh, 25th open. So if you'd like to speak, let me know. Thank you. I need a title and a written description, your presentation. Okay, Tim, take it away. All right, Andy, you want to get back up to introduce our speakers? 
First one's going to be Adam Broad. Okay, Adam. Okay, our and, first uh, speaker is Adam Broad. Go ahead, Adam. Adam, you're there. Unmute, and uh, let's get started. Okay, just like that. <clears throat> Before I begin, oh, I would just like to have a few moments of silence for those who are suffering and mourning. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, so for those who don't know, I'm Adam Broad. I, I am a former public servant in Lake County. I'm currently finishing, just as a matter of full disclosure, I'm completing my term as a precinct committee chair in the Lake County Democrats. I am not seeking to renew my position in the next election. I formerly ran for Congress as a Democrat and was removed from the ballot. And then I, I had a brief campaign as a Green Party member. And this uh, this conflict is actually related to uh, why I left the Green Party and why I left the DSA was because uh, that was endorsed in my con Green congressional campaign by the uh, West Suburban Democratic Socialists of America, which I had been a part of since 1985. And there was a controversy over Representative Jamal Bowman going to Israel with a peace group called J Street, which I have supported since 2010. And uh, DSA pretty strong on their uh, boycott, divestment, and sanctions of Israel we had talk of removing Bowman from his membership and at which point and, and the Green Party, which I was unaware when I joined the Green Party, the Green Party did not recognize Israel or uh, recognize green, Greens in Israel, they, um, that they also were a strong BDS organization. And uh, when I when I when this controversy with Bowman came up, I went to the West Suburban DSA and, and told them that they would have to consider removing their endorsement of me. And because of uh, I was opposed to BDS and was a supporter of Israel and I always have been. I'm Jewish. I was a member of a Zionist youth group when I was a kid. I was part of a group. It was called Hashachar, which was Young Judea. And uh, like a lot of Jews, I have always supported the right for Jews to have political autonomy in the land where Jews originated. Um, I was told that, um, and I'm, I said, I've had a dissenting view on this position and always have. I, I had no problems organizing with people who felt different from, from me on that because I had been part of an earlier divestment movement. My, my activism started in the mid eighties. I was part of the divestment movement against apartheid in South Africa. So it was kind of a, a personal conflict for me to be on the, the other side of it. And also, you know, the kind of, uh, kind of tore me in different directions you know i guess as a leftist progressive guy uh you know being at odds with so many of the comrades but what i was told as a congressional candidate was that uh, i was allowed to have a dissenting view at least at that time on bds as long as i did not publicly state it in other words i was allowed to have an opinion different from the majority in my group as long as I didn't publicly make a statement. And I thought that was, uh, I basically folded my campaign immediately after that. And I never said anything about it at the time. I just stepped back and got out of politics, basically, at that point. And then sometime later, before the this conflict uh, was renewed by the attacks in Israel, I, I had 
resigned from DSA. I was just put a social media post up saying, you know, that my, uh, that immediately I was no longer a member. Um, the, 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 the inability to express a dissenting minority view is a deal breaker with me in any organization. It was originally why I was disillusioned with the Democratic Party was because I felt like my view on single payer health care was being silenced because, you know, the, the Democratic Party didn't want any of their corporate candidates challenged by any progressives. And um, anyway, that's my background. Personally, I suppose, as far as the conflict goes, my background started in a synagogue in 1972. I was eight years old. We were in synagogue praying for the Olympic athletes who were being held hostage. And uh, we then heard that they'd been killed and that we all said the mourner, mourner's prayer, um, the mourner's Kaddish. And uh, that was formative. Years later in college, I was a journalist and I worked for the Daily Egyptian and we didn't publish on Saturday. I actually showed up at the newsroom on a Friday afternoon. My buddy was, you know, he was my boss and my editor and friend and was wondering where we were going to meet later on for drinks and all that fun stuff. You know, college, it was Friday and the newsroom was empty except for the student editor and a photographer and myself. It was normally a bustling place when there was a paper coming out the next day. And we received a call that there was a Palestinian protest on campus. And I said, and I was asked, do you want to go cover it? And, and, and I did, you know, sure. I was a story. I ran out. And um, so there was, you know, I guess my introduction to a narrative different than the one I grew up with, uh, that I was there covering it. And again, I was covering this story because I was the only one in the newsroom. I was the only reporter in the newsroom on a Friday when we got the phone call for an unpublicized event. And I remember <coughs> the idea of any kind of coexistence or peace was out of the question for the Palestinian organizer of this event because he said, it's all our land, it's all ours. And it seemed to me that in this conflict were a winner take all conflict I was going to be on the side of, you know, my people, the Jews, you know, and uh, be as staunch Zionist. And, you know, if, some, if someone had to have it all, it was going to, it was going to be ours because of our historical claim and our religious claim, et cetera. But it was through J Street in 2010 where I began to moderate my views and see the potential of a two-state solution, not just the potential, the necessity of some sort of coexistence, some kind of pathway to the senseless killing, just at some point, you know, just stopping and making a better life for the future generations. Um, it has become more popular um, in the Jewish community over time. I mean, in 2010, uh, no, it was, I think still, J Street is rejected on the left for being Zionist. Okay. And it's rejected in the, you know, the Likudniks for asking for a homeland for the Palestinian people. But that's where I'm at politically. I, I support a two-state solution. And uh, I guess one of, the, one of the, and I don't have all the answers how we get there but i i have seen some problems in the prevailing narratives on the left and on the right where it just seems um as one person wants it this is this is a war of bad against bad you know the you have the hamas you have a, you have a genocidal effort on the palestinian side and um what has been called a genocidal effort on on the, um now Israel is claiming to seek only the destruction of this terrorist group that's hell-bent on 
destroying Israel and, and in its charter declared war on all Jews everywhere. But, and here I'm, I'm going to start saying things that are, are going to annoy people all over the spectrum on all sides of this issue. Uh, <coughs> Bibi Netanyahu is clearly a national security failure. The idea of putting these national security failures in Israel in charge of this uh, this effort to uh, get rid of Hamas is, is seems ill-advised, <laughs> it, it, you know, to put it mildly. Um, he's unqualified. He he's, has a long stream, string of bad judgments with regard to regional politics. You know, going back to the Iraq war where he said that the, you know, parroting the Bush administration and cheering them on saying that the, the, you know, the United States going into Iraq would um, create a domino effect that would topple all the hostile regimes, you know, the opposite, you know, was it was a it was a growth of terrorism and created more conflict and displacement. And, uh, of course, enormous suffering among the Christians in the region who, uh, you know, unconcerned in you know, people in the United States, you know, in a, in a administration that the Bush administration, which seem to highlight its uh, Christian uh, credentials seem to be really uh, very insensitive and unconcerned about the slaughter of Christians that was being caused by this intervention, you know, and the growth of ISIS and the creation of an Iranian um, client state in Iraq. Which... I already have, but you gave me that and that looked just as good. Okay. What was that? Nothing. He's just some background of the restaurant. Adam, continue. Don't worry. I'll be on it out. All right. Well, you know. So, I mean, this is kind of the context here. Uh, BB and then Hamas, and I mean, I'm a student of military history, and um, I just, as far as on 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 the Israeli side of things, carpet bombing an indiscriminate destruction of of the civilian population. I don't see acquiring any strategic goal for Israel, you know, and I'm looking at it strictly from a, a Zionist point of view, you know, as far as like from strictly what's best for Israel. I mean, is, you're creating a, when you kill someone's, as we discovered in Afghanistan, when you kill someone's spouse, when you kill someone's parent, when you kill someone's child, you have an enemy for life. You're creating, you know, if you eliminate Hamas in this, offensive you're creating the next generation of terrorists uh with uh, this senseless violence it, it's not it's not going to end the fighting and uh what I, and mike and, and i signed representative talib's ceasefire resolution which uh, on the israeli side would be very unpopular because it's seen as like that i am somehow a hamas sympathizer and i'm quite the opposite uh, of that, and I, I've all, and I've been staunchly pro-Israel and staunchly pro-Israel in spaces that are hostile to Israel, and I've, I've, regardless of the unpopularity, I've always stood up and expressed my support of Israel. And um, if some famous fur-flying fights in DSA over this and the National Lawyers Guild, I didn't bother in the Green Party to to fight over it. I, at that point, I was just done arguing the Jewish perspective, um, just like a lot of Jews have withdrawn into purely Jewish spaces, which is not, I think, good for Jews either. And uh, getting to another side of where I stand on this, I don't think it's an expression of Jewish values to indiscriminately kill people. You know, I yeah. don't see, uh, I see when I'm at my best and I, my faith is not really strong, but when I have it, I feel that the life is a miracle given to us by our creator and that uh, we should be grateful for it and we should cherish it. And, uh, and I think we sort of as a collective species kind of shit all over this miracle that we have, this life. And I just don't think this is what Hashem wants for us this killing and hatred and it's like some this is what we choose with our free will we choose 
to have this world the way it is. It is a collective failure of humanity where we're at right now. And so fighting my own hatred and resentment, I, I am praying for myself to continue seeing the humanity of others and seeing my seeing the common humanity of people and 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 thinking hoping that this will lead us to a path a collective path of cooperation and there's a need for it i mean we have this climate emergency it, 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 it we're not going to have political policy forced at the end of a, of a of a weapon it's only by a call me an anarchist, if you will, that we all have to sort of voluntarily, mutually see the crisis, the real crisis of humanity, an existential crisis, and see that our survival as a species depends on finding these cooperative modes to coexist and work together for these problems, mitigating, like mitigating the climate emergency, like feeding the hungry, and just to make to leave the world in better shape than what the way we found it for the future generations, we're, we're failing at this collectively. Collective guilt seems to be a, a real culprit here, both in the Holocaust that was inflicted on the Jewish people and the attacks in Israel and the attacks in Gaza all seem to have a, a common thread of collective guilt just raining senseless and indiscriminate death and suffering on anyone you identify as the other without seeing the common humanity and and so i guess so i'm not rambling on and on about this situation i, I would like to conclude with just sort of a a jewish biblical argument for peace and coexistence and uh i was taught you know first of all i want to say that in my zionist youth group i was taught to want peace and i was taught that israel wanted peace and that there would be peace if only the arabs or as golda Meir said when then they learned to love their children more than they hate us um there could be peace and uh, i don't think Israelis are loving their children more than they hate the Palestinians. Speaking as the son and grandson of combat veterans, I know that even my grandfather fought in World War II, you know, the good war. Any normal human response to killing other people is a kind of permanent suffering and pain that you carry around with you your whole life. Anyone who's ever lived with combat veterans understands that, you know, unless you become a, a senseless, you know, unless you, you're just numb to it, you've become brutalized. You, you really, you know, and my dad, he was a Vietnam veteran and he was kind of a badass, but he was haunted and he suffered and he had mental health issues. And it's just, that's, that's, that's what the killing will do to the soldiers. I don't know most people, on the pro who are purely pro Palestine don't give a damn about the IDF soldiers and what they have to carry with them the rest of their lives. But I do. And some of them are the children of friends who serve in the IDF. And uh, I would, I'm spinning off the rails here, but that's what this topic always does to me. At least I'm not screaming. Uh, and what and what else can this kind of killing do except make you run through the streets screaming, pulling your hair out sometimes? I don't know. Uh, this hard to break this down into rational thought when you think of the actual devastation that's taking place. But. But I do think it's in the it's not just a, a good thing to stop it. I think it's a necessary thing because the, 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 this violence has the potential to escalate and actually, you know, uh, threaten all of us. Right now we're here, you know, the United States, we get blithely unaware of the horrible potential for this escalating into a nuclear conflict. And it's there, especially if we don't 
have a path where Israel can agree that there's a path to security and peace for Israel. I mean, if the idea is just to get rid of them or just to get rid of the Palestinians, it's not going to happen. And uh, I see the main problem right now is this collective guilt. I see um, there what Orwell warned us about, the boot stamping on a human face forever. We're looking at that. And the argument seems to be what whose boot it will be and what color the face will be rather than that we should not have this kind of brutality and that we need a more cooperative path for humanity to survive. Um, I hope to gather my thoughts and be more coherent. I've been wanting to write a blog and put it all in order. And I've just been blocked by just the sheer level of horror and pain and it's almost it's been above me, my ability to to put into words and and I agreed to do this today because I knew it would force me to just clear out, out some of what was in my head and put it out there and then uh, once it's all out there like a shotgun blast on the wall all splattered out there the way it is uh, I would be forced to maybe think about what I said and and organize it better and rather than just remaining silent, because I have been just silent and, you know. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to like unburden myself with some of these things because it's been weighing heavily on me. And as soon as the attacks went on in Israel, it was very obvious what was happening next. And uh, I was I was not only grieving for the Jews, in Israel, I was grieving for what was about to happen in Gaza because it was predictable. And I cannot believe that some of my comrades were out celebrating. I can't, it's another ironic thing in this horror that leftists would be dancing on the graves of slaughtered kibbutzniks. But here we are. This is our nightmare. Pray for peace and work for it. All right. So, Go ahead, Ed. go ahead. I was muted. Adam, thank you very much. Go ahead, Chuck. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Adam. And uh, so there will probably be some other speakers here, at least two here, that will uh, add uh, comments, uh, different things uh, to what you said about what's going on over there and how it affects the United States and the world. Thank you for your thoughts. And there's Ernie. Ernie Norman. Ernie. Right. Ernie. Ernie. <laughs> Now we're in port. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes, we can, Arnie. Okay, this speaker seems to have been fixed from the last time I was up at the table here. Um, I have been uh, in a state of, of being bugged ever since October the 7th when this thing happened and the, and the, and the things that happened after. Um, what the remark I would start with is that we here have been very, very lucky in the United States uh, because so far, we've only had one death that I'm aware of due to this, a Palestinian boy out in the suburbs here that was killed due to prejudice. Would you like me to start later? Okay. Um, and then two hospitalized students, I believe, in New Hampshire. And there was something I didn't catch the whole story where, where a Jewish person was set upon in some way just in the last couple of weeks. That's it, we've not had a bad time with it, but that could change. Uh, I'm very concerned for my Jewish friends uh, and acquaintances and Jewish people that I don't even know uh, that this worldwide uh, massive increase in anti-Semitism uh, could become worse and could become worse here. And it could affect a lot of us, including many of my friends uh, now, or in the future, and uh, it's it's spreading, uh, you know, like wildfire. Uh, now, people, some people seem mystified: is why are we suddenly having all this anti-Semitism? I don't know if they're not listening to the news or what, but it seems to me that it, the best way to start dialing this anti-Semitism back is by dialing Benjamin Netanyahu back, way back. Uh, he's an authoritarian 
We've been running an apartheid state for quite a while, uh, running an open prison uh, in Gaza. And uh, the, the, the best solution to this whole situation, the two-state solution, he has been resisting, okay? Now we do need to recognize, I don't, I don't go along with the uh, Palestinians who say they want to take Israel back any more than I would agree with, with you know, the, uh, the Indians here, the Potawatomis, if they wanted to take over Chicago again. No, 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 I don't think that's gonna work. We have to acknowledge that land and, and who controls the land changes from time to time, uh, changed in this country. Uh, not in a good way, necessarily in a clean way, but but uh, uh, somehow starting about 400 years ago, a little more uh, the change started here and in South America and many other parts of the world as the great nations of Europe colonized the entire world outside of their world. And uh, some, with some bad effects, but with some good effects too. Uh, culture was spread, technology was spread, and so forth. And, and in fact, we need for an increasing population we need more land for more people. So the unpopulated areas are going to have to, so people who have those are going to have to give up a little bit to, to support the po uh, population, uh, the growing population of the world. So I think the Palestinians have to recognize this. Uh, but what is a possible solution to this? I think the best one that has been put up so far is, uh, is the uh, Oslo Accords. I think that was 1995. Uh, they were finally settled between uh, uh, Isaac Rabin and my my old my who was the Palestinian leader at that time? Yasser Arafat. Yasser Arafat. Thank you. Use the microphone. These these people did not uh, were diametrically opposed for many years, fighting, 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 and they finally came up with and agreed to Oslo. Uh, best solution I think that anybody has come up with. Well. How did uh, some of the uh, conservative Israelis take that? Isaac Rabin was assassinated within months. Okay. Went over to Shimon Peres, who was a little more conservative, a little more uh, toward, the, toward the right. And then came uh, Ehud Barak, who was again more centrist, but he only lasted, I believe, for one term. And Israel has been kind of uh, resisting not just Netanyahu, but a lot of people, but especially Netanyahu, have been resisting the Oslo Accords, which is, which is simply that the, the main uh, tenant of Oslo is the two state solution. There are a lot of details here and there. It did not cover Jerusalem, how Jerusalem would be handled. It did not cover the right of return in any thorough way, I don't believe. I'm not an expert on this, but I think that's what it is. If somebody knows more, they can bring that up. Uh, but it, it did present two state solutions. And this, this, this could work, but uh, could be fair to both sides, actually. But frankly, uh, Be Benjamin Netanyahu has made it clear that he didn't want that. He didn't care. And as far as giving the, the uh, Palestinians reasonable treatment in the meantime, uh, he's, he's shown not to be very good on, on that either. He's not uh, holding in the uh, settlers in the settlements. He's making more and more settlements, even though these are uh, against international law. And when you have a fence, uh, I never realized there was a fence quite like the one that there was between Israel and Gaza. But just in it, in it you know, you have to give credit to the, to the uh, Palestinians to figure out how to get through this thing. And they did with almost no, no technology. Uh, I don't I think it's, uh, it looks like it's at least 15 or 20 feet tall. And they've got machine automated machine gun towers along it, and cameras and everything else. The first thing one ought to know when you see that fence is we have a problem here. We've got people on both sides of that fence, and at least one of them considers the fence necessary. That indicates a problem to begin with, aside from all the other things we have. Uh, in any case, um, like I say, I'm, I'm vehemently opposed to Benjamin Netanyahu and the Likud and their views. Uh, I have been accused of being anti-Semitic. I deny that. A, a Jewish friend from this group, in fact, accused me of that and then later apologized. I you realize, no, I wasn't really anti-Semitic because I said some anti-Israeli stuff. I'm not even that anti-Israeli. I'm slightly anti-Israeli because they elected Benjamin Netanyahu. But there was a, a, a lot of 
talks that he would not make it another term because of his personal problems. Maybe he would have, maybe he wouldn't have. Uh, I may be mildly uh, uh, anti-Zionist, but in my earlier remarks about the fact that land changes and 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 who controls land, this changes. That's just the natural nature of humanity. Um, what should we do? Uh, why is U.S. policy the way it is? Well, you will all remember that Joe Biden got up the day, the next day, and said, "We are 100% behind Israel." We don't care about what the Palestinian. He didn't even mention the word Palestine in that or Palestinians. He just said, we're behind Israel 100%. Okay, he's a politician. You can kind of understand that as a first reaction because we have about 255,000 Palestinians in this country and we have 6 million Jews. If you're a politician, that's kind of one sided. You're kind of likely to, to lean toward one side. Uh, that's understandable. Plus the fact that uh, Biden did have a close personal, my understanding is he had a close personal relationship with Benjamin Netanyahu going way back. Uh, however, he's been dialing it back uh, quite a bit. He's, he's the one who says, you know, uh, that Israel has kind of gone over the top in their in their response. I mean, let's face it, what is it now? 28,000 dead Palestinians or maybe more by now uh, versus uh, 1,200 Israelis, and I guess we have to add in the Israeli soldiers. Probably by now, that number is probably three or four hundred that have perished in the fight. Uh, you know, that's that's uh, in most of the past conflicts, it's been 10 to 1 dead on the Palestinian side, uh, approaching 15 to 1. Now they're approaching, now they're, you know, above 20 to 1. And uh, this is this they consider normal, which, which, which I do not. Um, the thing that we should do is end any funding to Israel, especially funding and weaponry that permits this to continue. Uh, it's reasonable to give them some weaponry, considering that they're in what might be considered an unfriendly neighborhood. But on the other hand, uh, not so much uh, now. And as far as humanitarian aid, Israel has a higher per capita GDP than any country, than all but about two countries in, in Western Europe. I believe Germany and UK are the only two countries that have higher uh, uh, per capita GDPs than Israel. So Israel, it, well, back when Israel was a young country and forming and they had a lot of problems, uh, that was one thing, but it's not that way anymore. Uh, so that should be, that should be seen. Uh, totally aside from the from the moral issues of uh, giving weapons which are used to kill people uh, unnecessarily, and just touching on the damage that's done. Okay, we're we're uh, I think over twenty eight thousand dead, um, more uh, close to half of whom are children in in uh, Gaza, and at, a few weeks ago they had destroyed forty five percent of the housing units in Gaza, probably more now. I asked the question glibly, now who's going to pay for that? Who's going to rebuild that? Okay. Uh, my guess is maybe it's a lot of it's going to come from U.S. taxpayers, but we'll see how that goes. Um, and, and one of the other reasons for, uh, for Benjamin Netanyahu, I touched on this earlier, is personal problems. As long as this war goes on, he can avoid all of the personal issues and the charges that he's up on and possibly going to jail. And, um, okay. Um, I talked about, I talked about that, and uh, I had a couple of other thoughts, if I can think of them here. Um, I think what I'm going to do uh, is sit down, and then maybe in rebuttal period, I'll have uh, a couple more uh, thoughts organized on this. I'm very, very disturbed about fact that uh, um, the extent that we are supporting. I think what I do think is that uh, it makes our presidential race uh, even more disturbing. The thing that bothers me is that for the next five years, well, not for the next year, but for the four years after that, we are going to have probably one of two men as president, Joe Biden or Donald Trump. And 
none of those give me a warm heart and a good feeling about our political situation. So anyway, uh, that's it for now. I'll be interested in hearing what people have to say about this. And we'll go from there. Thank you. All right. Charlie's next. Thanks for Charlie. All right. Uh... Thanks, thanks for the talk. And our next, our next speaker is Charles Paydock. Uh, go ahead, Charlie. Go ahead, Charlie. All right. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Adam and Ernie for uh, filling in at short notice. I'll be very quick and concise, only covering four areas. The this issue, this incident, this whole issue uh, was brought up at the college complex as they trace the history back in March of two thousand and three. Um, the uh, some young people showed up, and they were affiliated with what is known as the ISM, the International Solidarity Movement. And the reason they they spoke out, uh, uh, pro Palestinian, and the reason they did is because there was an incident in which a young woman, a peace activist who had gone over to the Middle East, and her name was Rachel Corey. And she, in the middle of a protest, uh, she had accidentally been killed <clears throat> by a bulldozer operated by the Israeli military who was bulldozing the homes of Palestinian people. And she became something of a, a, a figurehead. And the, that was the first time that there was any anti-Israel sentiment that I can recollect being expressed. It was a topic of some discussion, but that was the first time prior to that any anything again. There were even there there I can recollect pro-Israel demonstrations in the Federal Plaza. During such times as the Seven Years' War and things like that. And anything against Israel would have been regarded as anti Semitic. Mm -hmm. However, things change. And Rachel Corey is still somewhat recognized and acknowledged by the Palestinian people today. They have very various memorials in her memory uh, so that this was a significant event. And that at that point, it came to mind that the young people were were changing their sentiments on this issue and expressing concern for about the Palestinian people, which we had never heard before. Uh, the, sec the other thing is, uh, of course, the United States had a pro-Israel policy uh, and still has to some extent today. Uh, they do receive a significant measure of aid that was some issue of some concern. But yes, we had affiliated, the two countries had affiliated. Uh, so that's what I mean. There was very little expression of in, in favor of the Palestinians. Now, the third thing is, I've been a study of Museum of History for many, many years. And actually, I find it rather distressing. But it's been remarked that the history, for example, of the United States is the history of real estate real estate and much of the history of the world is the history of real estate i find it amazing that columbus came here to the americas and the first thing he did was claim it as his his land and no sooner after that did the other european powers uh start claiming uh the americas as their land and this goes on throughout history. The Americans themselves, even at one time, had convinced themselves that they had some sort of manifest destiny to occupy the entire continent to the Pacific. Uh, they thought there was some force. Uh, so this concept is operative. And the real estate dispute, Ernie briefly mentioned it, continues on today. What comes to mind is situations like Tibet, in which China came up with arguments that, in fact, dating back, they went back in history, that, in fact, Tibet was, in fact, more than a province. It was a part of mainland China. 
Uh, so you see it evident in so many different situations. And I'm not, this territorial imperative underlies many, many issues. This territorial imperative undermines a lot of foreign affairs, particularly in the 19th century and even in the 20th century in our European and, and Asian conflicts in World War II. Um, the fourth thing I'd like to say is, I think you have to approach this issue. Please don't approach this issue from uh, which side are you on, boys. Uh, there are probably possibly conceivably arguments in any of these situations on one side or another. Various claims have various degrees of legitimacy. Uh, there are, in fact, cultural conflicts. Third parties come in and start drawing lines on maps. Uh, it's often been said anytime you see a straight line on a map, it was done by a colonial power which no understanding and it's only cause that resulted in problems. Uh, anyhow, uh, just a few thoughts to consider. I do think that sometime or another, a third party such as the United Nations may intercede and bring about some sort of resolution uh, to this issue and more positive activities. Uh, I think both people seek a life of peace. Uh, without fear of harm, and I believe it is achievable if the parties, the more powerful parties, have to exert some pressure on these uh, entities to come to the table. Anyhow, thank you very much. Okay, I don't know who's next. Who's next here for rebuttals? No, that's it. Now we open it up for questions. Yeah. Well, you want to open it up? We're way early on the questions. We got, a few we, more we got, want to we got, we got another half hour for speakers. At least three more for ten minutes apiece. Lee, 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 come up. Come on up, Lee. Come on. We're getting the questions in about half an hour. All right, if you got more speakers, let them go. Yeah, All yeah, right. we we got more speakers, Charlie. Here, come on, Lee. This is Lee Cole. Go for it. <laughs> okay, I started looking at this thing. When I realized I was going to CPAP with the Chicago Peace Action Conference in March. And basically, the, the thing that struck me about all of it was genocide. When I went to the, to the conference, I had about 10 pages of the research that I brought. And I listened to a Palestinian uh, testimony of how he had been. I don't know what you call it, persecutor, I guess is the word, for ever since the Israelis showed up. And the, the persecution, um, I've read so much stuff and I've seen so much stuff. The persecution is beyond what I have ever thought people would do to each other. Um, there's a book called, or a, a magazine article in the planet called The Destruction of Yasser. Uh, Ma, no, Master Yapa, Yasa, uh, Master for Yasa. Basically, it's disgusting. You know, here's a family. The mother says, uh, We got to get out of the school because they got a bulldozer coming. And the bulldozer comes and polish, polish, you know, completely destroys the school. For what? Because the Israelis don't want the, Jew, the uh, Palestinians there. I read a piece by uh, Al Jazeera saying what we've got is called settler colonialism. You remember when the Americans showed up, they had no respect for the people that were living in America. They killed them, they pushed them out, they took their land, they destroyed their culture, they tried to. You know, they actually took, kidnapped a bunch of their children and put them in uh, schools so that they would not learn the culture and heritage of the Indian, the Native American people. You know, this is what we do when we're settler colonialists. And that's exactly what the Jews are doing. As a matter of fact, in this article by uh, Al Jazeera, he said that the Jews were actually appropriating 
the culture of the Palestinians as they show it. You know, if, if this is Palestinian food, now it's Jewish food. If this is, you know, just goes on. That's what happens when you're in settler colonialism. But when the guy who started uh, Zionism, I, I forgot his name now, um, Herzl, yeah, thank you, Herzl, he basically said, so what we do is we tear down the house, we tear down the old house and build the new house. Now that's what's called genocide, so you can put your new uh, civilization. And that's exactly what it's been ever since it started. In 1948, when they got the partition accords from the UN, Harry Truman said, the pressure, the threats, the uh, intimidation was so intense on the United States and on the UN, I couldn't stand it. I was so disgusted. I was so disgusted. That's what he said. And before the partition, uh, when people started talking about, we've got to consider this issue, Harry Truman said, well, I really wanted to have a place or a, a range for these uh, persecuted Jews in Germany to have a, a place to live in peace. But on the other hand, I didn't want to create a Middle East conflict. Now there's a book out called Beside Our Best Intentions. Basically says everyone in the UN didn't want to bring the Israelis into an already settled Palestinian uh, land. But the Jews went on and on and on and forced and forced, and they finally gave in, and they got what they were afraid they were going to get. When uh, when this started, you know, it was both 48% until 67, and then the Jews established or declared 78%. Not only that, they also declared that the land that they were in was their land. So, you know, they basically control the lives of all the Palestinians. Meaning, if you if you do something wrong, you don't get any water today, or this week, or next week. You don't get any food, you don't get any electricity. We control it all. That's how they treated the Palestinians. Um, I went to a conference in Evanston in the 17th and 18th. Uh, it was a Jewish rabbi and an Israeli professor, I mean, a Palestinian professor. And they talked about, you know, the history coming up to and so on. So, and when I got done, I walked out, I said, they didn't talk about the situation. They didn't talk about anything. You know, what they did was cover up the problem so everybody go home comfortable. Nobody said the word genocide. <coughs> Nobody said the word uh, killing. Nobody said the word, you know, violence or anything. And I've been reading what these Jewish columnists write. And uh, this one guy said, oh, the, uh, the Hamas is so terrible. They brought a war on, on us. <laughs> I said, war? Let's see. They're throwing rocks. You've got planes and bombs. How are we doing for a war? It doesn't sound like a war to me. And, and when they talked about... Um, the October 7th massacre, every Jew in my uh, discussion group at this conference said, oh, this, it was just too terrible. Those are the most inhumane people. I couldn't believe it. And I said, well, you know, interesting because when it happened, a bunch of students at Harvard that they were, they were protesting and they said, the October 7th was the fault of the Israelis. Now that's actually true because if you're a persecuted people, you don't have the weapons or the power or the money that the other side has and they're persecuting you. You have a couple of choices. You can play, you can beg, you can you know grovel, or you can fight back. And when you fight back, they call you a terrorist and kill as many of you as they can. Unfortunately, that's what's been going on. And you'll notice that um, Biden is always 
deporting Israel. And then he's kind of saying, well, they really shouldn't kill so many kids. You know, they should kill fewer kids. I don't like it when they kill many kids. Well, I, I uh, went to Wikipedia on a, a piece called the Irish uh, the Israel Lobby. Uh, three of the paragraphs were quite let's say eye opening. One said sixty percent of the money that financed the private money that financed the Democratic presidents for the last several years was from Jewish groups. Sixty percent. So if Biden wants to go it alone against the Israelis. You got to find another source. They also said um, the the Jewish people in America, surprisingly, I don't know how or why or when, ninety four percent of those Jews live in um, eleven states with powerful electoral vote counts, and there are very what's called swing uh, constituency, which means. If you support us, we vote for you. If you don't support us, we don't care. We're voting for him as the guy that does support. Us. So as a result, um, and there were a number of quotes in various other articles that said, I knew that I couldn't stand up against these guys because they got all the power. I looked at uh, the, the lobbying that's done by the Jews. Uh, uh, Dwight Eisenhower uh, was so driven by, I don't know what we call it, so, uh, well, whatever, he was so upset by the force and pressure of the Jewish lobby groups that he actually went to one of them and he said, okay, look, here's what I want you to do. Get all of you guys together, have a meeting. You decide on one policy, then come to me and tell me what you want. So 50, 50 lobby groups have joined the presidential something of Jewish something. Like that. 50 groups. And that's not all of them. There's other groups that are still involved. APAC has already said they're committing $100 million to remove every progressive from our Congress. You know, the if you look at what progressives are asking for, they're asking for what every other nation has. They say, we want universal health care. Every other nation has health, universal health care. Even Russia gives their people health care insurance that we don't give. China does. Well, I don't know what I didn't study that. But Israel anyway. does too. Pardon? Well, Israel does too. Yeah, I mean, that's basically these articles all said there's only one country. Here we are. Raise your hand. Yeah. yeah. Um, China doesn't. I'm sorry. China doesn't have universal health care. I can, I can. He says China. Has China doesn't have universal health care. No, it doesn't have it. But uh, I read about that. It said 95 percent of the people in China are covered by some form of health care. In America, 25 percent of Americans have no health insurance. 50,000 go bankrupt every year because they can't pay that medical debt that's already piled up. And there's about 50 to 60,000 that die every year because they look at what it's going to cost for that treatment that they need. And they say, I can't afford it. And then, of course, two months later, the hearse comes up, picks them up, and takes them up. That's America, the great country of America. So, uh, if we lose the progressives, we're done, I guess is the word. Because they were right, you know, the, the right wing, if you want to call them, the Republican Party, the power elite, whatever you want to call them, they've basically taken away just about everything. They're now trying to take away Social Security because I actually live well, and I know they don't want me to do that. They want to kill Medicare. They've got Medicare Advantage has already enrolled half of the people in, that are you know eligible for Medicare. If you look at Medicare Advantage, the American Medicare system run by the government has an administrative cost of 4% of the revenue. If you look at a, a private, a for-profit corporation like these Medicare Advantages, how much do they spend for advertising? 
How much do they spend for promotion? How much do they spend on their million dollar, two million dollar, five million dollar executives and all the rest of the administration? So tell me they're covering it with 4%. Please tell me. This. And when you get done um, and you talk to some of people, they say, well, they, they treat me very well. They, you know, they give me eyeglasses, blah, blah, blah. And Tom Hartman came out and said, Medicare Advantage is uh, candy drops. And uh, I can't remember what the bad part was. He says, to get you on board, they give you stuff that you really you know, feel great about. But then when you've got that $10,000 bill uh, or operation that you need, they say, well, we're not going to cover that because in the next thing you know, you're dead. And not, that's how they make their money. I'm sorry, but that's the way it's true. Now, one of the other things that they do, which uh, was pointed out by, I think, Common Dreams many years ago, when you're treating the elderly in the Medicare programs, you give them a, a, a I don't know what it's called, a risk factor or some kind of a factor that says, this guy's in pretty bad shape, so he's going to cost more, so you know I'll give him a 50 instead of a 20. Okay, all these Medicare Advantage programs were taking people that were, should have been 10 and telling Medicare they're 50. Medicare's giving them I think it was $20 billion one year that they get when they audited. $20 billion they stole from the American taxpayer to put in the pockets of their shockholders. Now, they, uh, from what I understand, they've been doing that for decades. When we found out, you would certainly hope people would be in jail. They would never be allowed to do it again. And they just, they keep doing it. You know, it's apparently the Medicare Advantage people have bought the uh, CMS, you know, the people that run. Yeah, how does this relate Medicare. to Gaza, though? Ah, uh, you see? <laughs> the state doesn't care. No, yeah, okay, the state doesn't care. And I, oh, here, let, let me, uh, this is a piece that came out today uh, about a march today to stop Israel's genocide. And uh, one of the quotes that I heard on NPR he said, you know, during the 1960 Vietnam War protest, a serviceman lighted himself on fire, and it was the top news story for days all over the world. And yet the same thing happened, she said, the same thing happened yesterday. Now, I don't know if that was true or not. That is true. Okay, it is true. And she said, and no one has been able to find anything in the, in the press about it. I mean, it's like, huh? Who did what? I mean, it, the NBI did. active duty. Air, uh, Air Force service man who lit himself on fire in front of the Israeli uh, consulate in Washington, D.C. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's right. And one in Atlanta. Also. American. Another one in Atlanta. Okay, yeah. let's. Uh, so, are we done or should yeah. I? Do you, do you have anything else to say? I, well, unfortunately, I do. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this, this, Lady that wrote this book. For the past five months, Israel has massacred Palestinians, largely civilians, with bullets, missiles, and bombs. And now they're escalating the use of another weapon, hunger. And I think if you know, um, uh, I, I heard this on uh, NPR I think today. There's only one logical way to bring aid into a, into Gaza. And that's with trucks. The Israelis have stopped that, or they've cut it back to the point where instead of 500 trucks a day, you get 100 trucks. So the Americans are dropping food in from airplanes. Well, that's, you know, it, it's like uh, the Americans pay for the bombs, the Americans pay for the, all this stuff. And then when the American people say to Biden and the, the administration, hey, Stop it, you're killing them. We gotta help them. Then they say, Well, Jimmy, what can we do? Can we do this? Can we do that? Are you sure we can't do that? No, what are we scared of? Apparently, the Jewish or the Israeli people own our government beyond this uh, six percent. Because if I were Biden, we wouldn't have this anymore. 
It's just ridiculous. But he's saying, well, stop it. Please cut it out. But we got to have a peaceful thing. Don't kill so many. I'm sorry. He, oh, brother, there's her. Biden's, and this is another one that she said. Um, Biden and the politicians in Congress are trying to send an additional $14 billion more to Israel. Now that's for bombing Palestinians. Far from dissuading Israel, the U.S. wants to send money so that Israel can take its war even further. Now that's pretty well saying what it is. The U.S. Israeli, the U.S. Israeli position has never experienced a defeat in the arena of public relations as it is experiencing now. If you remember, we had an apartheid situation in South Africa. The whole world was opposed to it and screamed at it, except you'll never guess who, the United States. We were finally driven to get off the support so that the apartheid would stop. Yeah, here we are again. We're the only ones. We're the ones, you know, uh, I think 54 sanctions by the United Nations over the years telling Israelis to stop killing the civilians, stop destroying their homes, stop taking the land. 54 sanctions. You know, that was more than half that they had given to anybody in the world during that period. More than half. And the United States says, wait a minute, if you don't sanction the Palestinians because they fight back, we ain't going to support it. We'll beat those suckers. They did that. It's called the Negroponte policy. Negroponte. You probably remember him. Okay. Um, okay, I'm, I'm up, right? We got, we got other speakers coming up. Oh, okay. So. I just want to tell you that, um, oh, I guess I meant, did I mention this? Uh, there's a book about when the UN was asked to bring the partition or give Israel, you know, give them Jews in Israel. The book is called Despite Our Better Judgment. And the other thing that Harry Truman said was, neither, however, did I want to see a political structure imposed on the Near East that would re result in conflict. So everybody that was involved in this decision knew what was coming. They didn't want to do it. They were forced to do it. And now we have Genesis. No applause. <laughs> okay, who's all right, Andy? <laughs> no. Hello. Good evening. Uh, my, I'm Andy Anderson. And um, for the last 40 years or so, my brother and I have been running an information service in which we condense information and books into one page briefing papers. We call it database translation. And for those of you who have been following the college, no one has ever produced credible evidence that any of the facts I've listed here have been anything but 100% true. And that's we've, had pe we've had people uh, like Charlie that uh, will attack me personally and say I'm full of horse manure and everything else, but he's never produced a shred of evidence anybody else. And early on, you may remember, I held up a $100 bill and I said, if you want to question one of my facts, put your money where your mouth is. You put up a $5 bill, I'll put up a hundred. I have, <clears throat> remember that? Andy, if you're a horse manure, that's not an investment I made. So is he. <laughs> well, uh, we've reached a point where being the devil's advocate in this age, uh, is helping uh, Trump and Biden, Trump especially, run out the clock going up to the election. They're doing everything they can to run out the clock. So all of you should mark a date on your calendar. That's November 6th. And we have a choice collectively as a nation. Are we going to vote for a, a green, uh, possible green new future? Or are we gonna go into darkness in a dark age? There's a couple of websites that are already coaching people how to live without electricity as our grid gets sabotaged. We are, the United States is running uh, what the military in 1985 called the decapitation magnet. If you're doing something to your enemy, 
you're getting closer and closer and they realize uh, we're doing something to them where they can't survive. It, it behooves them to, catap to decapitate our government with some kind of implanted bomb or something else, uh, something to bring the nation to its knees so it can't uh, be a world power promoting terrorism everywhere. The leading, the leading source of terrorism on planet Earth is the United States military industrial complex. And what's going on in Gaza is supported by the United States because as our, I think our previous speaker said, if you slaughter women and children, you, you drop bombs on hospitals. So the survivors have to go out with a bucket and a spoon and try to pick up the pieces of their children. You're gonna create a hated, uh, an enemy that hates you for life. And um, it keeps, it's a justification for our military industrial complex to say, we need more and more money every year because there's terrorists everywhere. Well, yeah, there's terrorists in a lot of places because our country is creating them. That's the game plan. Vietnam was an enormous success for our military industrial complex. And of course, there's an old saying in Vietnam, they said, well, uh, we're sorry we had to destroy that village, but we had to destroy the village in order to save it from communists. Uh, so in order to uh, Israelis have the same uh, mindset, well, we have to kill two million Palestinians in order to save Israel. It's, it's the essence of the word evil, if you look it up in the dictionary. And <clears throat> two websites, uh, well, there's more than two, but one of them is called Natural News. The other one's called Dark Ages Defense. <clears throat> they're, uh, they're selling equipment and solar panels and generators and all kinds of back to the woods materials for people to survive after the, uh, the electric grid goes down and they have no electricity for a year or two in their state. And that can be brought about quickly if people decide to attack the electric grid. A, a book called Brittle Power was written about that 44 years ago, published in 1980. APAC, another thing that right now <clears throat> the media is making it look like there's a horse race between uh, Biden and Trump in votes. Well, 80% of the country could, voted, could vote for Biden and 20% could vote for Trump. And Trump can still be installed by the legal maneuvers that they're putting in place in certain states to deny the electoral college vote so that if neither party, neither candidate gets 270 electoral votes, it's pushed back to the Congress. It's one vote per state. Well, the Republicans have a 26 to 24 majority, so the Republicans can vote not to seat certain uh, progressive people uh, so that they can keep control of Congress. They can vote to install a president, they, they can do anything they can. And then uh, there's a, web, a website, uh, well, Common Dream, Smirking Chimp, a bunch of uh, websites have published the Republican Trump game plan, what they're gonna start doing on November 6th. They're already interviewing 50,000 Trump toadies to take the place of 50,000 civil servants that run all of our basic uh, EPA, uh, you know, FDA, civil servants that uh, are, are not normally political, that, that do the business, the work of the government. And they're, 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 they're top 10 things they want to get rid of within the first week. They want to cancel all regulations on the fossil fuel industry. Drill, baby, drill everywhere. They're going to cancel all funding for solar, wind, uh, high energy efficiency houses, go back to burning as much fossil fuel as fast as possible, pollute the rivers as fast as possible. Big churches in the South are teaching the same thing they taught in 1987. We'll get a whole new planet when Jesus returns, but this one has to be destroyed first by Armageddon. And, and uh, the Armageddon, they're, they're looking forward to a nuclear war, actually, or something close to it. We'll get a whole new planet when Jesus returns, but this one has to be destroyed first. So we're doing God's work. Now, that shit was insane in 1987, and it's insane today. And all of us sitting back Democrat, uh, debating whether Republican or Democratic views are better, we're not looking at the big picture right in the face here. We're looking at billionaire predators that have no ethics, morals, and conscience. And we're looking at these megachurches that are getting out the vote 
to in install these insane people in offices so that they can take over the country. And uh, that'll be a, this will be the last election if Trump wins. If they install Trump and we don't do something about it, then democracy is gone and the college of complexes will cease to exist because they will come out and arrest people like us tonight talking about these things. This will be against the law to criticize anything that our government is doing. Just like around the world, you, you will look what happened to that poor guy in Russia that didn't he criticize Putin and they assassinated him. <clears throat> so for those of you that weren't aware, Jeffrey Epstein wasn't the first pedophile ring does this uh, guy have anything to do with Gaza? Uh, yes, it does. Uh, give me a minute, Charlie. Now, what the, the Israeli, the United States, the United States allowing and cheering on Netanyahu running a genocide in the Gaza, uh, in the Gaza Strip, that's enabled by a whole bunch of Democrat and Republican senators that can be or are being blackmailed by APAC, the Jewish group. APAC basically owns and operates the American Congress as far as uh, what they can do to criticize or promote things for Israel. And uh, it, this started in the 1980s with the Franklin scandal when uh, uh, Larry King, uh, who ran the savings and loan out in Franklin uh, in Nebraska, he was running a side ring funneling young boys and girls from Boys Town into the Reagan White House and other high ranking politicians for uh, the pedophiles that were staffing our government back then during the Reagan years. So this kind of mental, uh, you know, moral corruption really took off. We took off with the election of Ronald, election of Ronald Reagan and the installation of the Bush crime family. When Bush was his vice president and then we had we had 12 years of Bush crimes between 18, 19, up to 1992, and then we had eight more, eight more years of Bush Cheney crimes from 2000 to 2008. So we've had a huge number of criminals masquerading as Republicans running our country, and then the Trump is the ultimate, of course. Trump isn't even a politician. Trump is a corporate criminal, a, a megalomaniac psychopath, long-time mobbed-up corporate criminal um, we're, we're doing money laundering for Putin and the Russians for over 30 years. Okay. That's who and what he is. And if we don't face that and talk about it, we need to have six or eight talks at the college here over the next six months, talking about what people need to know to avoid our country going into darkness on you know, November 6th. Thank you. All right, uh, go ahead. Uh, our last speaker tonight will be Ellen Corley, and then we'll go into questions. Uh, yeah, thanks, Tim, uh, for giving us this opportunity, and Charlie, you know, uh, for talking about this critically important topic, and, uh, you know, um, on Palestine, and I wish I'd had a chance to prepare, but uh, like Andy and Lee and, and the others have said, um, there's just so much, you know, we are triggered by this uh, Normally, actually, you know, this college opportunity to speak is four years ago, I was going to give a talk on the Supreme Court and uh, the betrayal of the American people and ended up at the same time writing about the promised software, how it had been stolen. And basically, here four years later, the conclusion that that my research has come to is that it's a total cover-up machine for the United States government. They, what we have here uh, is as a researcher, you know, my whole life has been a research analyst, but, and I've continued to read and read and go, what is driving this? What is causing this? What, how can we stop it? You know, you can't stop a cancer unless you know exactly what it is. And it, if it's a single cell parasite that our government has made, you know, they at Fort Detrick, the CRISPR lab financed by the Congress and Homeland Security. And uh, that's, it, 
right, the Department of Defense, the the Cancer Society, you know, the um, the Fauci's American what thing for research infectious A M R I I D, uh, you know, for infectious disease. That you don't know how to stop a pandemic or you know, the origin could be coming from Wuhan, but you've got to get to, you know, what's the real origin? And it always comes back to the United States, the Department of Defense. When did that start? You know, uh, the collusion with the Nazis that we were working with in World War II and we go back to World War I, you know, it's always been the power elite. That's talking to Lee talks about you know, the power leaks and C. Wright Mill. And, you know, you, you know, as you, I've been reading that, you know, ever since I last worked full time in 2002, 2.22.02. So kind of a, a people's gas as an analyst of trying to, an intelligence analyst figuring out what, what the strategy is and what's going on, you know, so what, this is 20 years I've been researching this. It, um, you know, but the researcher, if they're honest, has to keep saying, like an intelligence analyst, really like, you know, if you saw the winds of war, it was like the Navy sending a letter to FDR. The assumption is that we are trying to get the truth, you know, about the enemy, who it is, and stop, World War II. That was always the implication that our we've got a CIA and FBI, uh, you know, MI6, our allies, you know, um, that we're always the good guys, right? Churchill, uh, right? Uh, but really, the only thing that makes sense now is you realize that we've been offered a version of revisionist history, you know, ever since we were, I was born in 55. But ever really since 1947 with the National Security Act, that the real enemy is us, you know? I mean, we are, there's an invisible empire, the settler colonial, uh, you know, manifest destiny. It, um, you know, this has always been how empires and civilization, and but this is how we are, you know? Um, one of the best books I read on it is Howard Zinn's The U.S. History of American Empire, right? And, you know, I read it and he made a lot of sense talking about, uh, there's also William Bloom talking about rogue states and America's democracy. Um, we, are, we are doing exactly what the Nazis did. We're doing like what the Roman Empire did to Jesus, right, There's, and the Israel, you know, the King Herod did to Jesus, also what Saul and the state of Israel did to the Christians, you know, um, they're basically round up those who are opposed to what they say and kill them, you know, as an act of state. This is the policy of our foreign policy of an empire. Right, that it's, um, you know, if, if you study it, I, really the only way to deal with being angry and upset and, you know, desperate, how are we going to stop this, is to understand it. You know, um, I, there's atomic, biological, chemical warfare. There, I saw a documentary on it about South Africa, how America was developing this uh, biochemical, just a, a little you know, handful of this can kill millions and millions of people. And we, you know, the scientists, South, South America was developing it. They tried to bring the guy to justice, never quite did. He supposedly destroyed it, who knows? But this is, once you look at bioweapon, you know, it's their bioweapon and basically the vaccine we study is a paid for by vaccine countermeasures. That's why we build 
these viruses and these vaccines so that we, you know, supposedly can get a step ahead of it. But what you realize, as, as David Ike explains, it's a problem of a problem reaction um, and then problem reaction and then solution. So basically all of these problems are manufactured, right, by us, um, you know, and then we've got the solution. So it, like, you know, Noam Chomsky said, stop manufacturing dissent or, you know, or consent, it, whatever, it, you know, the, it's all manufactured by a kind of war state and, and there's a lot of lies about it. Through, this was the strategy of tension planned by the Operation Gladio, the NATO Western Allies after World War II planned the strategy of tension, Operation Gladio, which is to keep having false flag terrorist attacks and then people are confused and then they, they up the, we give up our rights and say, give us a police state. You know, uh, you know, this is when they talk about like the Opticon, you know, like 1984, you know, this um, idea that we're all, they're just watching us all the time, like a prison with a all CNI. This is true. This is Pegasus. This is, you know, they, it's in the phones. Tucker Carlson was talking about it last week. He says, this is why you're ah! slow so quickly is because it's been affected with Pegasus. So anyone who is dissenting and talking about the truth is taken out. I, I was, um, you know, last a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago with William Pepper, who found this to be true with Martin Luther King. And, and that's why he, uh, you know, we've got to figure out, okay, let me just make my final point on this is, with two final points, okay? One is that this is called historical negationism. This is called historical revisionism. There was a plan to, to do this and cover it up. Basically, these, there's been a big cover-up machine covering this up. But if you look up historical negationism, you can see how this was used to cover up the um, you know, Holocaust and they revised it always, you know, so our narrative has been just written two different ways. And that's why you can have, you know, AGP, it doesn't matter which group you're with, it, there's, we're not going to win the game until we define, it, you know, the real cause of this. And the other thing is, and this is evidence that we could use in court, is this policy paper called, um, but it, that was in Plus 972 magazine talks about the options for a policy regarding God's civilian population. The plan, this was written on October 13, 2023, that they're going to have to push all the, the population down to the Sinai. And, um, you know, they're just like, yep, this is the strategy. This has got to be done. What's, one thing they don't tell us is that there was already $500 billion contracts in the, um, for the oil and gas written by the United States, Israel, and Egypt, leaving out Palestine that was signed in October, the same right before the, the uh, October 7th attack. They also don't tell us that the news was completely manufactured by the New York Times. It, it was on Max Blumenthal this week, along with um, The Intercept, and um, Amy Goodman reported on it, that this news of, of uh, the Hamas, you know, getting a pregnant woman, you know, tearing the baby out, cutting the baby's head off, cutting the woman's head off, these were all fabricated. And, you know, the media, New York Times will not, will not retract it. And there's been other immolations of people burning themselves that went with 9-11 truth and in Atlanta, you know, but we didn't hear about it. So if the news doesn't report these things, it, it is like 1984. So, okay, thank you. All right, now, Andy, right, I'm gonna let, thank you. Thank let's you. go to questions now, unless somebody else. Well, can, can, I have, can I say oh, something? Go ahead, Kelvin. 
Okay. Um, I'm kind of uh, coming a little bit late. The first speaker who came on is, is a much new uh, agreement. The last speaker, anybody who, who quotes Tucker Carlson loses all credibility. I'm afraid. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the, you talk about a lot of stuff that doesn't happen in the news. Uh, having been to Israel, admittedly, it was quite a few years ago, about 1992. Um, the first misconception that you're, um, you're, going, you're going to lose is you have a, you, you perceive that uh, Israelis all live in Israel and the Palestinians all live on the West Bank or in Gaza. This is not the case. There are a lot, large amount of uh, Palestinians in Israel. Uh, there's not just Palestinians. There are Jews and uh, Bedouins and a, and a large amount of Muslims and there's Samaritans as well, there's other people, the Christians, etc. Um, the third largest part, and there's a lot of people talk about apartheid in Israel. Um, the third largest party in the Knesset is Muslim. The head of the Israeli Supreme Court is an Arab and is a Muslim Arab. If you were to live in the Middle East and wanted the most amount of civil rights, you'd want to live in Israel. One of the funniest things I ever saw was, and this, this current protest was, uh, on a college, American college campus, lesbians for Hamas. Hey, could you imagine lesbians being in Gaza? They'd been, they'd been left five minutes before they, was, before they were crushed with stones. Right? Now, there's an awful lot of things that don't make news. Yes, she's quite right. There are a lot of things that don't make news. I wonder just how, um, how dovish and how pro-Palestinian, how, how, how dovish... You and how democratic party leaning and whatever you guys would all be, how peacenik you'd be, if there was rockets being fired every day into Texas, Southern California, and New Mexico. I wonder just how how you you, you would be feeling about Mexicans if, and this is true, if they were if they were having helium balloons to float over the Rio Grande, and you had to make up a, a rhyme because those helium balloons would have booby trap bombs attached. And you had to make up a rhyme so the children won't pick them up and play with them. Right? So this people wonder why Israel is so hawkish. Well, they've had 70 years of conflict. Right? Now, I'm not saying that the Palestinians don't have a cause. Of course they do. And I'm not saying that they, 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 there shouldn't be a two-state solution. Maybe even a one-state solution. If Gaza and the West Bank and all of that was incorporated to Israel and everybody got a vote, but that ain't going to happen. And guess what? A two-state solution isn't going to happen either. Because on both sides, both sides neither recognize their, their, their right to exist. Okay, Kelvin, I know that was a statement, but that we, we let you go. Now, yeah. who, uh, that's all right. I, I understand why. It's a very big issue. Adam, I do have a question for you, though. Um, in hearing this tonight, has anything uh, really changed or has it been more thought-provoking for you in this thing? I'm finding this very uh, thought-provoking myself. Uh, can you comment on if you've learned anything new or if it's reinforced some of the things? I'm just asking you for a little bit of, you were mentioning earlier that you were, this is the first There's, time you really had a chance to go. So, I didn't have a lot of time to prepare my remarks. And um, so, I, I mean, I didn't hear anything new. I have been immersed in this and I appreciate the, the last speaker. Uh, thank you for acknowledging you know, the civil rights of Arab Israelis. And, um, and you know, when people talk about apartheid in Israel, uh, it's, there, there is a big difference between being an Arab Israeli with Israeli citizenship and being an Arab in the occupied lands uh, the, the, in, the, in the West Bank or Gaza. I mean, and they have been a lot like open air prisons um, because, you know, in reality, there's, there has been an ongoing conflict 
I mean, people talk about it, and I, like the last speaker made this point. Israel just, you know, is like, and then, and I also have heard the, the there were like I'm hearing the Jews, the Jews, the Jews, where it sounded like the protocols of the elders of Zion or the white nationalists when they talk about Israel or the Jews or, or or the Nazis when they talk about the Jews, you know, it's like you know this collective a homogenous lump. I always say, uh, you know, ask a dozen Jews, get two dozen opinions. But when other people talk about us, when non-Jews talk about Jews, it's always like, you know, like they we're just this homogenous lump, this conspiracy, this powerful, manipulative group of people. Um, I mean, we we have survived tremendous hardship. I mean, uh, <laughs> And for us, the conflict isn't didn't start in 1948. For us, the conflict started 2,000 years ago. You know, the war against the Romans, which resulted in the destruction of Jewish self determination in on Jewish land. I mean, the, the the catastrophic military defeat. You want to talk about a Nakba? What what happened to Israel with the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple? Um, I, I hear overall it's just a lack of understanding or knowledge of what the Jewish perspective is. I, a lot of people talking about Jews without really knowing what they're talking about when it comes to Jews. I mean, and and, and speaking as a Jew who's lived in who lives in a Jewish community, um, it, like humanity itself, where it's not that easy to. To get a grip on, there's certain patterns you can pick out, but I mean, we we are just human after all, and um, and 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 when you when you and and like I said, the last speaker, thank you again for pointing out there isn't a nation on earth that wouldn't have responded to that attack, um, and and. and yeah, and certainly it's been a a, a, a catastrophic. It, it's certainly it's been a matter of uh, reprisal, and uh, what what's the word? Uh, yeah, just p blind payback, and not not really uh, achieving any strategic goals. I, that was one of the points I made. But um, yeah, that's just very human. Um, I was approached by a Ukrainian, no less, at a party many years ago who uh, was spouting some of this East European crap, you know, about the Jews controlling the banks and this and that. And uh, I was just like, you know, for a bunch of people that seem to control the world through a secret conspiracy, there were an awful lot of us shoved into the gas chambers and um, went up the chimneys in the crematoriums, you know. That doesn't look so powerful to me. And uh, some of the comrades, uh, they did justify what happened in, in Israel by from uh, at the hands of Hamas. Is like, and I heard that point expressed. You know, it's like, you know, what do you expect from a uh, an oppressed an oppressed minority? Um, where was that line? I remember one of the the. the you can play bad gravel or you can fight back. Well, that's exactly what the Jews have done with Israel. That's exactly what Israel is. We spent 2,000 years home, scattered to the wind, not allowed to return to our home, being purged, being unwelcome guests, being and trauma of the occupation and it is a trauma if the trauma and the oppression of a of, of a three quarters of a century of occupation and insult and oppression can justify what hamas did in israel and for god's sake don't downplay that the pretty well documented slaughter. Hamas documented their own slaughter of the, and then talking about, you know, oh, this did a baby, did a baby thrown in the oven or not? I mean, really, we're gonna argue about that. And I don't want to sit here and wave the bloody shirt. 
it doesn't do any good to, to wave the bloody shirts of the Palestinians or the Jews. It is not getting us out of this mess. And, uh, and Israel, love it or hate it, they're not going anywhere. They have nuclear weapons. They have the IDF. They're not going anywhere. And, and if you could force Israel to go away and disappear because they're the problem, the Jews are the problem, it's all about because we're a bunch of thieving homicidal maniacs, you know, and that we don't have any justification or, you know, we're just settler colonialists. Well, whether that's true or not, guess what? It, it, to make Israel go anywhere would create a, it would, they will drag their neighbors with them. You push Israel into the abyss, they're going to just drag all their neighbors and possibly us too into the abyss with them. There's no, so, and, and I don't think you're going to be able to get rid of the Palestinians either. I mean, you're not going to kill Pal. You kill every member of Hamas. You're not going to kill Palestinian nationalism. I mean, two thousand years of oppression didn't stop Jewish national aspirations. Why would it stop theirs? Um, so the two-state solution it looks unlikely, but you know they say necessity is the mother of invention. I don't see another way out of this other than letting this nonsense go on until it gets out of hand. It, well, until Israel goes nuclear one day, and if the, who knows when that'll be, or or when Iran or Russia or whatever start escalating this to the point where it's a world war, where you get Russia and the United States going full tilt into this, we need, uh, you know. So I'm not, sh I'm not shaken from my original belief or my original assumption that we need a, a path to peace, and I think that's exactly why the Israeli plan doesn't work because it doesn't lead to peace. Netanyahu's plan is to reoccupy Gaza. Jews have no business kicking down the doors and policing communities where Jews don't live. That's kind of a racist view, I guess. But I think that's the way they see each other. I mean, there's a very... Um, I mean, outside the green line and maybe increasingly within the green line. I mean, yeah. look, 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 look at the state of Jewish... Look at the state of the Arab land. Were expelled. Where, where, where in the Middle East do Jews live in Arab, Arab Muslim controlled lands as, as respected set, you know, citizens. You know, there's no place for us. So the idea is we're all supposed to live in one of these, you know, Jewish communities in the United States. It's it's okay for us to live on the occupied land of the first Americans. Apparently, it's the only place we're allowed to live. But it's also a question of who determines where Jews were allowed to live, and and how much do Jews really shit what non-Jews think when it comes to where 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 are we allowed to live and be as Jews? I think part of what happened in the Holocaust is we a lot of us stopped giving a damn what other people were thinking about us. We stopped, you know, the idea of living peacefully and letting the Christian or Muslim communities do whatever they wanted to us is out the window. And, and I think it's not a good thing. I'm not saying I support this, but that's just the way it is. It, it, that What you have is an oppressed group, a traumatized, paranoid group of people, my people, you know, they're all my people, really, because, I mean, we're all human beings, and I try to look at it that way, but I, I have a, a Jewish perspective. Okay. You know, I was raised... All right. all right. Okay, Charlie, you got the next question. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, I'm not altogether certain if classifying Israel as a rogue nation is a valid assessment. It's not, I don't think, a rogue nation. How does, I'm going to say, how, classifying any of these uh, things, I'm not, I'm not responding to you. how does it get us out of this mess? I, I'm not responding to you, Adam, actually. It's just a general no, I'm saying, I'm saying, I'm saying that's a, I guess that's the, the main I'm not point. I'm finished asking it. I, I, I'm somewhat curious that if it's valid to say Israel is a rogue nation. Now, it Yes, yeah, surrounded, I believe. I'm not particularly thorough on my knowledge of the Middle East, but I believe it's surrounded by countries which are hostile towards it. In 67, they sent armies to invade, uh, an invading armies 
into Israel. I also learned tonight that uh, an Arab guy uh, tried to make a treaty, made a treaty with Israel and was assassinated as a result. Um, I'm not certain if it's a theocracy or uh, a secular state, according to uh, Calvin, it's a secular country, which cannot be said of the Arab nations, I don't believe. Anyhow, anybody, you can answer this now if you like. Go ahead, anybody. Go ahead, Adam. It is a secular country. It has been, but right now, uh, the current government has a, is a right wing coalition, much like our right wing coalition. It involves, you know, a, the religious, re relig the religious right, and the, uh, you know, I guess the, uh, the kleptocracy right. You know, the, <laughs> the flim flam conservatives. Not to be confused with actual conservatives. I consider conservatism a legitimate political stance but we're talking about people who call themselves conservatives but are you know like trump would i think say he's a but he's he's a, he's a grifter like netanyahu they're both pretty much so it really isn't the ideology is just window dressing just like it is for a lot of political grifters of any stripe but um israel has a history of it, for many years being a labor democracy and, and, and it's important to point out that what killed the, la the labor coalition that dominated Israel in the beginning was that the Yom Kippur War, that the being almost uh, pulled to the rink of an, brought to the brink of annihilation by the invasions in, 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 in 73 that uh, discredited the left, Israel, as of being a source of national security. And as far as Israelis are concerned, the national security of Israel is the most, is like a primary concern. And part of why Netanyahu got elected and is that he's promised national security. He's proven to be a failure at that, but that was why the labor got party got discredited was what happened in the Yom Kippur war. Uh, as far as 67, Israel launched a preemptive attack to to to, to destroy any uh, possible invasion attempt there. But um, but in 73, failing to do something like that resulted in being overrun in, in the Sinai Peninsula. And then there was the battle of uh, in Golan where Israel lost more soldiers fighting in the Golan Heights. Uh, than they did in all their wars combined uh, up to this one where they are you know paying a price um which has been the game plan of the anti-zionist a war of attrition because there's only a limited number you know to keep just nibbling away and we can't also forget we can't underestimate the effect of the suicide bombing campaigns of the 90s at creating the atmosphere that pervades the you know politics in israel today and uh, I could say also, I think that it's a common view in Israel that rather than a vast Jewish conspiracy enabling their existence, it is their military power. And that the only reason why, and, and uh, they have been, uh, their neighbors have attempted to forcibly push them into the sea and annihilate them. And they have failed repeatedly. And it has caused suffering for uh, the Palestinians on the West Bank. And whereas the Jews who were, were expelled from Arab lands were allowed to assimilate into Israeli life, the, the Arabs who were displaced in Israel were not assimilated in Arab countries and have been forced into this terrible limbo they have, um, not having political rights or autonomy, unlike Arab Israelis who have citizenship and are elected to... Uh, positions in government and are part of political coalitions and part of the peace movement. There is no such dissent or Jewish representation in the Muslim countries. Certainly not Saudi Arabia. Iran used to had a long standing Jewish population. There were many Jews living in a lot of these Muslim countries. There, there were mass expulsions of Jews from Arab lands.
It seems to not concern people who act concerned about people being pushed off their land. We're talking about Jewish, ancient Jewish communities that were. And for that matter, if you wanted to give a disparaging portrayal of uh, the Muslim world in, in the Middle East, of Jewish communities being annihilated or assimilated by forced conversion. But um, lest you think I am uh, anti-Muslim uh, or something, I, I want to give credit to my brothers uh, in the uh, Independent Drivers Guild because in, in uh, as a cab driver and a limo driver, um, easy to not think of, you know, in America, we just chase the almighty dollar and we're just working our asses off trying to live check to check and make ends meet and uh, running on the hamster wheel. Not a lot of thought of God for many of us. Uh, the Muslim cabbies uh, would take time to pray. And I, as I worked at the airport a lot, I would watch them always managing to take time to, to pray to pray to Allah. And uh, it, it reminded me, of uh, my own faith it made me made me closer to my own faith in, in a good way and um i don't i don't think islam is intrinsically violent or 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 that muslims are my natural enemies i, I mean no more than christians are i mean we are all human and uh we we can choose to make a better world and learn to respect each other and coexist and i don't i don't think our religions necessarily make us uh, opposed to each other they can but um but i i lost a good friend recently because he thinks that judaism is part of the problem and that it's an old stupid religion and we just for the world for humanity to evolve we jews need to quit stop being jew we need to stop being jews for humanity to evolve and it's just like it's just so insulting to me especially as press, I, I believe in the Bill of Rights and I'm a very strong supporter of the United States Constitution. And it's just like, some of us are Jews. I wish some of y'all could get over it. Okay, we're gonna and have to. Yeah. Being a Jew, last point, being a Jew does not inherently make me your enemy or an enemy to humanity or make me a thief or a murderer. And it's like, I really resent those characters, those characters people most of us like everyone else are just trying to get today we're going to go to rebuttal period next we're going okay no no all right um, the american people hated the british so we had a revolution you know how many people in britain we hated the prince or the whatever he was the king uh the prime minister and uh, a bunch of guys that ran the army we didn't hate the guy on Soho Street or anywhere else. We called, I'm sorry, we called them British, but they, we didn't hate them. And it's the same with you. The Jews are killing um, Palestinians, but you're not killing them. I mean, you're a Jew. So when we say the Jews are killing Palestinians, we're not saying anti-Semitism. We're just saying the guy who's killing the Palestinians is a Jew. Some of my former comrades... Today. You don't, you don't have to say, go to jail for this. They have said I'm guilty. They have. I've been accused of. Uh, I'm. I'm. I'm guilty of murder just because I support Jewish political autonomy on the historic land of the Jews. That makes me guilty, collectively guilty, according to some anti-Zionists. Thank you for letting me off the hook, though, on the charge of murder. But some people would off so easily, and certainly Hamas would not. Can, can I just clarify this? When I was in Israel, my well, girlfriend at the time and the mother of uh, my daughter, um, now the mother of my daughter, uh, I was in um, a mom and dad's apartment in, uh, in Israel. And a mom said this to me, and it's quite unbidden, I didn't, didn't ask the question. She said, people wonder why I live here. And I'll tell you why. It's the only place in the world where I'm not a bloody Jew. Okay, um, now we're, we're gonna we're gonna go to rebuttals now. All right, and I'm gonna give everybody about <clears throat> one more question. What's your Ellen? question, Ellen? Who's it addressed to? Um, 
Oh, that one. I'll, I'll repeat it. Why don't you come to the microphone? Yeah. Come to the microphone, that one. Okay. Yeah. Do you support a ceasefire? And where do you envision, how do you think things should progress from here on out? I mean, you know, I mean, given how things are right now, where do you think things should go forward? Who are you addressing? Adam, she's addressing you on this That's one. For you, try to give us a brief answer if you can. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Um, that's been not, not not one of my better appearances. Um, brief answer: I signed the ceasefire resolution put out by Representative Talib. Uh, uh, I said that at the beginning. Um, so yeah, and if you want me to have a brief answer, <laughs> let's just start with that. Okay. And uh, and uh, and I'll quote. Dr. Abulash, the Gazan peace activist whose family was killed by, whose daughters and niece were killed by an Israeli tank shell during one of the previous uh, eruptions of violence. He said that we, uh, he suggested a few things, that we start to wear the cloak of humanity, which for me I, doesn't mean surrendering my Jewish identity, but yeah, to wear the cloak of humanity and to uh, get rid of regressive politicians. So uh, we may disagree. Uh, huh? Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, we're the choice is Trump or Biden now, but uh, I'll, I have one thought that I've been mulling over for the last fifteen years or so. I just looked it up. In square mileage, in size, the state of Texas is thirty-five times as big as Israel. My suggestion is, what you do when uh, children are fighting? Our mothers are taught. I don't care who started it, but we're going to end it now. We're going to separate you two. If there's, you know, two two dogs uh, in a kennel uh, and, and they're constantly, I have a customer that has two Yorkies and one of them stays in a cage and the other one runs around the house. And then they switch places because if you let them run together, they fight each other all the time. Well, I would say carve out take a big picture from the satellite of what the, the border of Israel looks like and carve out that amount of square footage land, square mileage land in Texas and pay everybody $5 million in the state of Israel, give them $5 million in a new home to relocate to the new, new Israel in Texas. And then the Arabs can have the desert and the land over there, whatever it is. And uh, the Israeli people, every last one that's living in Israel right now, they can come to the new Israel in Texas and live like kings. And we would put an end to this fighting with it. It's a tiny, tiny, minute percentage of the global population that is pushing our, our world toward war. And it's, it's, it's something that is it's suicidal. It's not survivable. And anybody that studies this sees we're headed toward going over a cliff, a one-way trip down. So let's put an end to it. Let's so the white out. guy is giving Anybody away part of the outside no. box. Okay, thank you. We'll have final remarks from our from a few of our speakers towards the end. All right, Alan. What a, what a stupid idea. All right, Kelvin, I'll get you next for a rebuttal. Go ahead, Alan. Two minutes. Okay. Yeah, I wanted to suggest that uh, regarding Zionism, to understand it, see the documentary. Ultra Zionism. It's on YouTube. I didn't understand it. You know, none of us did understand the Palestine Israel conflict. But seeing it, you know, this was in 1948, you know, them pushing people out and putting them in trucks. Uh, you know, um, this is what I mean by the historical revisionism that there's stuff coming out. Um, also, a great one is. Um, eyes wide open, um, uh, you know, on the history of the CIA and the Mossad and the MI6 and Gladio that, you know, when these young people can really put history correctly, it really makes a huge difference. There, I also saw a great one last night on, on conspiracy theory. I'd like to give a talk on that. 
because this guy, you know, really can, he, he also gave a talk on 1984 um, and, and how it's like the great reset today. And, you know, it's, this guy is real, uh, Klaus Schwab. You know, look, for, look at the website, look at what they say they're doing. And, um, and it's Yuvi Harari, who is his right-hand man, the World Economic Forum. Uh, it's, it's all right there, the plan, you know, of, um, it, it's like with the Project for a New American Century and a Clean Break. It was written by, you know, with Bush and Cheney and Netanyahu that they need a new Pearl Harbor. And this is how we got the 9-11, you know, attack on the World Trade Center. The, the, it's, it's done, you know, so that they could go to Iraq and, and, you know, and then from there, take the next five countries, you know, occupy them. That's why there was such a crackdown on the Occupy movement. You know, we're those of us who wake up and say, you know, we do have to go after the banks. That's when, you know, Occupy Wall Street was a huge crackdown, right? And so, you know, it, it's a war on dissent and the First Amendment, and we've got to come up with a strategy, which is what we're working on. All right, I'm going to go next. Sorry, Charles, what did you say? You know, I, I did something kind of a half-baked and crazy tonight. I simply asked this device through artificial intelligence what we could do to solve the Palestinian conflict. And you know something? It makes a hell of a lot of sense. The first point was, was to protect civilians. Israel should do more to protect civilians in Gaza. All sides should uphold international humanitarian law and provide for full humanitarian access. The second point was build an enduring peace to ensure Israel's security and the security of the Palestinian people. Efforts should be made to accelerate the build an enduring peace. The IDF should change tactics and should dramatically change its tactics to minimize civilian harm. No long-term reoccupation. The Palestinians are ever going to have a chance at self-assembled termination and a decent standard of living. There must be no long-term Israeli reoccupation and blockade of Gaza. Recognize Palestine. Only with full recognition of Palestine as a state in its own right can truly move towards a two-state solution. And finally, find a path together. Peace cannot be attained achieved solely through the military destruction of a terrorist organization. It can be founded on the hopes of the Palestinian people of living in freedom and dignity. That was put together by Google Generative AI just for about a big computer. Now, I will say this. AI might not be maybe generative, maybe somewhat simplistic in the solution, but we all know what it takes to achieve peace. And it's simple. There was an episode in Star Trek. We're not going to kill today. We are deciding not to kill today. And I'm going to treat my neighbor as myself. Jesus had a lot to say in the gospel. You will love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and you'll love your neighbor as yourself. Oh, come and I think on. if what we all started to get back it's not a, to a little bit more about our God and our uh, peace, I think we'd all be much better off by recognizing each other's humanity. Right. Religion is the source of problems. That's why there's a all war, right. man. All right. Let me just, all right, okay. what Tim all right, seems Don, to be, I, I, I couldn't, can I talk, okay, I, I could you got just, two minutes. All right, all right, I just noticed it, what, what Tim seems to be saying here just a second ago, uh, Tim was quoting, you know, thou shalt love the Lord thy God, uh, and, and thou shalt love thy neighbors thyself, it's actually in, that, that's actually a bit, Jesus does say that in the yeah. gospel, is that it? Okay, but that, okay, um, but that, that actually appears in, uh, in the Old Testament, so that actually is, part of the Jewish religion, not Christianity only. 
Uh, so what, what Tim seems to be saying is if only all the people over there were, were, were Christians and they all had the same religion, instead of, it, 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 hey, hey, one fool at a time, Tim. Okay, instead of, instead of, uh, instead of, you know, one group over here being Jews, another group over here being mostly Muslims, then, then, uh, then everything would be okay if they were all Christians. You know, y'all ought, ought to ask the Protestants and the Catholics in Northern Ireland if that would solve everything. And uh, now, um, all right, so, um, you know, Tim, what Tim said is, is very, that, that is kind of the, the United, the consensus of the United Nations is what, what should be done. But of course, in the real world, what should be done is very seldom what actually is done. Here's the problem. The majority of Israelis do not agree with that. And uh, or at least the majority of Israeli voters. And, and, and I think there's an argument to be made that the majority of Palestinians do not either. Uh, first off, the last time the, the ruling party in Israel, the Likud, uh, explicitly rejects the two-state solution. And um, they say, this land belongs to the Jews only. The Palestinians have no right to it. They can stay if they behave themselves, but if they don't, they must leave. That's the only disagreement among, among the Likud members is whether to allow the Palestinians to stay, provided they are obedient, or whether to get rid of them all. All right? Now, 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 well, now, now, hold on. Oh, oh, hey, excuse me, one clue at a time, please. I'm going to get to the Palestinian side now. Now, the last time, the last time there was a free election uh, in the Palestinian territories, Hamas won. They haven't had a free election since then. But Hamas won a majority of the seats. Oh, but okay, but Hamas won a majority of the seats. In, yeah, I have a I have a loud voice. Okay, Hamas won a majority of the seats in Parliament, and and so um, now they did not get to take their seats because the that was in the 2000. That was about, I believe in 2007, and the U.S. government, well, Israel, both Israel and the U.S. said they would never recognize a Palestinian government led by Hamas. And, and, and this was the liberal side. This was that Kadima and labor who were saying they're never going to recognize Hamas as the government of Palestine. And why is that? Let me tell you the reason. Because Hamas, its charter, rejects the right of Israel to exist. Hamas claims, just as just as Likud claims the whole of the former Palestine as the rightfully the land of Israel. Hamas also claims the whole of, for, of the former British territory of Palestine as its land. Uh, and, and there can be no state of Israel as far as Hamas is concerned. And the fight will not end until every last Jew in Israel has been either killed or expelled from what is rightfully, in their view, their land. So both sides agree. This land belongs to us and it doesn't belong to them. And, and, uh, and, and they both agree there cannot be a two-state solution. There can only be a one-state solution. So the only question is, is it going to be a Jewish state called Israel or is it going to be an Islamic state called Palestine. That's the only question. Much rather. All right. You want to go? Go ahead. Two minutes. <laughs> you got two minutes. The problem is there was, I wrote this piece to a Jewish friend of mine. I said, Rami, I loved, I'd love to live in the house, in my neighbor's house. But he refuses to move out. And I've tried and tried and tried. He still refuses to move out. Now, I'm not going to kill him. But on the other hand. Uh, all right. Who else wants to go now? Can I just talk to the ahead. Texas idea? Wait one more second. Kelvin, you're next in a second here. Okay. The reason. The reason that there, a Hamas was created is the same reason that there was an ISIS created, the same reason that there was an Al-Qaeda created. It's called the American government and the Israeli government. Unfortunately, when people are oppressed, they tend to react in what's called a terrorist way because the, arm, the, the armies of the big guys are just not something that they can beat with the armies of the little guys. Thank you. All right, Kelvin, go ahead. Yeah, can I just speak to the ridiculous idea that Ali had about Israel moving to Texas? Uh, number one, the deportation of Jews was the first solution uh, mooted, mooted in Mein Kampf by Hitler. Mm. Second off, 
It's not a new idea. It wasn't Texas, but the British had the idea of moving all the Jewish referees to Madagascar. Uh, that's not going to happen. That was that that was a non-starter. And you know what? You might as well ask everybody uh, in the world to speak Esperanto. It's not going to happen. If you want to understand Israel a little bit, what I suggest you do, and Tim, this will be a good idea to Christians amongst the audience. Yeah. What I suggest you do, if, you, if you're ever fortunate enough to take part in a Passover ceremony mm-hmm. where, the, where the Jewish family will get together and all friends and family, and they will tell the story of Exodus from through the pharaohs in Egypt and the, and the, and the exile from uh, uh, and, uh, and the passage out of Egypt, the ten year ex- uh, uh, wandering in the deserts, and they will it will take part. In the whole it's a whole evening um, ceremony with food and wine and songs and stories, and it takes about four and a half hours. It's it's a, it's a big it's a big long ceremony, but the point is, at the very end of the ceremony, there's a prayer, and the prayer is. Next year in Jerusalem, even people who live in Jerusalem say the prayer at the end of Passover. Next year in Jerusalem, they don't say next year in San Antonio, Andy. They say next year in Jerusalem. Your idea is ridiculous, and it's actually quite. Uh, do you know? I might as well. Do you know? Uh, you know? You guys, you guys have got problems. But well, you know what? If the British had said to, um, just said to the Americans, okay. Well, you've got this war going on with the Sioux after the first, after uh, you know, and you've got the civil war going on between the southern and southern northern states. Why don't we shift them all to Africa? How just how happy would you be that that is an incredibly patronizing idea and incredibly stupid? I'm sorry, but it is happy. Okay, all right, who's okay, Ernie? Go ahead, yeah. Uh, I hope I can remember all my remarks. Two minutes, two to three minutes, maybe. There was a, how yeah, a couple, of, a couple yeah. of comments here. Um, you know, a few centuries ago, the great nations of Europe colonized most of the world outside of Europe. Uh, they've all left. Uh, the one the one colony that is basically still there of Europeans uh, is Israel. Uh, and there, there may be a few others, but you look at, uh, uh, you know, Western Hemisphere, that's Pretty much settled, and we we decimated Canada. we decimated the oh, native Israel, people people in, in uh, I can wait I can start a little later okay never mind um, in South America if we we just uh, diminished the Indians and pushed them off to their land we, we killed a lot of them but not all of them or in South America they they killed uh, they killed most of them as far as state terrorists. Uh, Colonial people have, have been terrorists for years. I mean, all of these nations that Europe colonized eventually won their freedom. Most of them in the, in the 20th century, uh, but along the way, there were certainly several bouts of violence where violence was involved. And we go back in this country. We go back to Geronimo and and uh, the other Indian Indian chiefs. We go back to the times of Romans. Romans colonized a lot of areas outside of Rome, and there were, you know, uh, uh, through northern Europe and into Spain and everywhere else, and the people fought back. And eventually, they won their freedom from the Romans uh, that were uh, that were trying to colonize. And so, so this business of, of violence, uh, you know, on this whole issue, uh, almost everybody's talking about a ceasefire. That's fine. Uh, I'm one of the few people, I think, although I think I heard from, maybe it was from Adam, that uh, maybe the Palestinians were very justified in what they did, and they should have done it more. They tried several times with different unspotted and so forth, and uh, until they're given some form of justice. Now, it won't be moving all the Jews out. That's not going to happen. But some form of justice that is more acceptable, other than uh, the uh, Second class status or third class status they had for years. I'm going to take that to solve it. Uh, I go back to Oslo. While not perfect, I think it's, it's a framework that could be worked with if everybody who willing to. Okay, Charlie, you're going to go next, and then I think I'll end you. 
Charlie, you're next, and then Andy. Uh, I want to thank everybody for uh, speaking tonight. And I just have two simple things to say. I heard uh, Andy is correct. If, if you, it's difficult to locate Palestine on a map of the world. And I think in terms of area, it's not much, it's about the same as the Chicago metropolitan area. <laughs> it's like Chicago and Evanston or something like that. And it's rather, yes, it, it's, it's rather difficult to ascertain what, there's not an awful lot of land that they're disputing about. It's totally insig it's insignificant. It's de minimis, actually. Uh, why there should be enormous conflict over such little parcel of land is, uh, now the other thing is, I've got to ask Tim this, um, now you've got two groups and they're ethnic groups and they're both profess, I've heard, to be deeply religious. So then I, I'm only left to conclude that the problem is religion. Uh, unlike Tim, who thinks religion is the solution, it's the problem. If they were secular humanists, there'd be no dispute whatsoever in that location. So that's what I mean. Um, the problem is the solution is not religion. That's the problem. Anyhow, thank you for everyone coming tonight. I think we've all grown a little bit in our understanding of this situation. Thank you. Okay, Andy, go ahead. I have a couple of final comments. Uh, one, I think Charlie made a good point. He's absolutely correct. Uh, you know, people of different religions have been fighting with each other for thousands of years. And Bertrand Russell, the English philosopher, once said, I'd like to get the top 100 leaders of the top 100 different religions, get them all in one room at a banquet at the same time, and then say, each one of you claims to have the proper word of God. Well, I can tell you mathematically, 99% of you are wrong. One of you may be right. I don't know which one it is. That's why I'm reserving judgment. I can flat out tell you, 99 people out of the 100 here are dead wrong, and it's time to stop fighting each other. And um, the suggestion I would make for Calvin is to try to listen a little closer. I know you're in England somewhere. Uh, try to listen a little closer to the, the suggestions we make sometimes. I was uh, floating that suggestion as the example of what could be done. Move 10,000 people or destroy the planet, and we'll start over when Jesus gives us a new one. I mean, that's what we're faced with here in America with some churches teaching that uh, there's no end to the conflict. It's, you know, people are teaching that what's what's happening and they're, they're prepping for Armageddon in the Middle East. These churches are supporting the slaughter of women and children in the Palestinian territory as part of God's will. That was insane in 1987. It's insane today and we should call it out. It's not a legitimate religious belief. It's a mental illness. And if, if we allow people with uh, fanatic religious beliefs to cause the destruction of whole countries, what does that make the rest of us, right? We're all, we're all part of the human race. And for those of you that don't know yet, military files are being opened all over the world, producing videotapes uh, in military encounters by the hundreds of encounters with the other four civilizations we've been interacting <laughs> with since 1945. And they have all kinds of videos of the UFOs uh, keeping us out of nuclear war by hovering over missile silos and shining blue light down in them and disabling the nuclear warheads. That's been going on in both countries since 1945, since we entered the atomic age. That's but true. That's, one of, that's, a, that's an above top secret uh, story in America up until now. Now they're opening the files and it's being shown on the History Channel, uh, the Sci-Fi Channel, uh, in books. We're headed into uh, the future if we have one. But we don't have a future if we allow religious fanatics, a small percentage of the human race, to push us into Armageddon. And that that can easily be done. All you have to do is watch the movie War Games, see what can happen if an accident is allowed to 
go to its its final conclusion with with nuclear weapons. So uh, we should talk about this more uh, where we are and where we're headed and beneficial solutions. Those talks will be coming up uh, hopefully. Uh, Charlie will schedule them over the next few months as we head toward uh, what can be possibly the last election in America on November 5th. All right, Thank Adam, you. I'm going to give you the final word tonight because you've been mostly the person with most of the questions. So I'm going to let you get in a final word tonight. So uh, you got about five or six minutes. So go ahead and uh, we'll close after you're done with your final remarks. Yeah. <sighs> I think I've said plenty, and uh, I, I would, I guess, I would say um, I'm going to try to express myself in a more organized, coherent manner on my website. I'll probably finally write that blog, God willing, at uh, AdamBroad.org. I would say uh, that religion can be the solution. Because one thing about the Muslim and Jewish faith is that we share an acknowledgement of the same patriarch. Mm -hmm. We are, by virtue of our own faith, brothers and sisters. Abraham is our common uh, father. And uh, I think uh, there can be a religious solution. I, I mentioned in my remarks that I thought there was a biblical solution, you know, as far as the things I learned in Hebrew school, there's mm -hmm. things in that I was taught as a matter of the Jewish faith that can point us to a better way. Um, there's a story about uh, Jacob stealing his birth, his, the birthright of his brother Esau by this, Isaac by putting on some uh, lamb fur to appear to be uh, his hairy brother to receive his father's blessing and then as a, later in his wanderings he runs across his brother who he's basically defrauded even from from the, the Jewish perspective he has defrauded his brother and his brother is now the head of a, a mighty group of people and uh rather than killing him or being angry with him what he's done he um he embraces his brother who he misses and loves and uh i think uh we need to remember that these people are our brothers and sisters many of them probably descended from the jews who were forcibly converted to islam you know uh, now suffering you know, at the hands of family members. Um, we are part of the same family. Um, I appreciated the Christian sentiment. I think Christianity is a beautiful faith when it's worn, when it's worn well. And it, it can be part of the solution too. I, I disagree with this lefty, secular, uh, one-size-fits-all atheist agnostic point of view. Uh, I, I I go with the American constitutional view that all of us of you know good you know whether we're atheist agnostic Jewish Muslim Christian Hindu that we could all uh, we could all be part of the solution according to our own faith. And uh, I'll, I'll end by quoting something from uh, the Jewish Talmud: the, the righteous of all people will have a place in the world to come. Okay, Adam, I'd like to thank you very much for attending because I know what it's like when you're kind of forming your own views and uh, trying to make sense of things. I mean, I'm still trying to make sense of a lot of this stuff myself. Um, I do know too that I've also been a Toastmaster for 23 years and I do know that you know you're humble enough to say that you know you you, you don't know it all and that you're learning and that uh, you're working on it. But I'm really kind of looking forward to seeing your blog and maybe having you come back in a few months with a little more refinement and a presentation on your for a full uh, fledged uh, speech here at the college. If you'd be willing to come, and Charlie would like it. 
But anyway, I do appreciate you coming. And for everybody here tonight at the College of Complexes, whether it be online or in person, um, I honestly think tonight's one of the first times that I heard a really reasonable dialogue about what's going on in Gaza and Israel without all the uh, heated uh, vernacular discussions. I know at times it did, but this was probably one of the few times that I've seen some very calm, very divergent views expressed. And that's what free speech is all about. I thank you guys very much for coming. Yes. Can I make any short remarks? Go ahead. Let, let Ernie wants to make one more short remark, and then Ernie, what you're going to do is you're going to adjourn us after that remark. Okay. <laughs> one short remark, Ernie, and then I will adjourn us. I forgot to say this before. I don't want Andy to get away with people thinking he's the first guy that thought of this Texas thing. <laughs> I've been thinking about that for a long time. Because Southern Texas, they they not only they, they the climate is similar to Israel. They have access to the ocean. They have access, direct border access to their strongest ally. They have direct border access to a choice of reasonably priced labor. The only irony of that, if we took the southern part of Texas and made that the new Israel, the largest city would be called Corpus Christi. <laughs> <laughs> All right. With that, we're going to say good night to everybody. I'm going to stop. All right, Andy, go ahead and adjourn us. Okay, thank you all for tuning in tonight and coming in person to the College of Complexes. Um, we will not have a college next week uh, because the restaurant is closed at five o'clock for maintenance is that on March third. So we'll see you March, here. No, on, no, March third. March third. March third is, is next to Saturday. No, March third is tomorrow. It's tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow. Oh, tomorrow. Yeah. We're oh, right, sorry we're about that. I, I misread that all together. I hallucinate. That's why I don't no. drink, people. I hallucinate enough as it is. Uh, so uh, we'll see you all next weekend and uh, have a happy week. Thank you, and we're we're adjourned.